Hello and welcome to our 13th YouTube video lecture. Uh, this one is on settling the West homesteading. Later on today I'll upload part two to this which will deal with the Plains Indian War. So let's go ahead and get right into this uh, lecture. And let's talk about homesteading here real quick. This was known as the Great American Desert, uh, the prairie grasslands, all of this area that's out west still, that is still basically territory, places like Nebraska, uh, Oklahoma, uh, eventually up into Wyoming, the Dakotas. There, there was a lot of thought of, well, okay, let's eventually get out here now and let's start uh, to turn these territories into states. Uh, but a lot of people wondered, could crops actually grow here? This was prairie grassland, uh, just thousands of miles of just this prairie grass, and um, which is a completely different type of uh, product as compared to the wheat and corn that they're eventually going to bring out here. During the Civil War, the Republican-controlled Congress tried to entice people to go here uh, with passing the Homestead Act of 62. This, they tried to pass homestead acts before the Civil War, but the South had always stopped them, and it was obviously the issue would be because of slavery. Uh, can you bring slaves into this area where the North didn't want it, and the South did, so the South would never support a homestead act? Once the Civil War took place and the Republicans controlled Congress, this is how they're able to get this homestead act passed, this idea of getting people to come out here and grant them certain amount of acres of land, anywhere from 100 to 150 acres. And if they could cultivate the land and produce on it within, let's say, a five to 10 year period of time, the land became theirs, uh, very cheap land. If they couldn't, they'd have to eventually turn it back over to the federal government. So this was trying to entice people, obviously farmers to go out here, but it also enticed uh, the railroad industry to come as well, uh, because they're looking for cheap land to eventually build their railroad line uh, all the way to California. We'll talk about this a lot later. They will wind up digging up all this prairie grass. Um, people are coming out here and enticing people to do this through this advertisement boom. Railroad companies are advertising. Western states are advertising to bring more people out here. Of course, land speculators, steamship lines. This whole industry of advertisement is starting to uh, emerge in the 1860s, 1870s. And they're going to come up here, and, and like I said, they're going to dig up this grassland. Well, why? You know, is this going to have any effect on the environment? All this prairie grass that's been around for thousands of years is now going to be dug up and replanted with wheat, mostly, and also corn. New inventions are going to come along. Uh, the steel industry will explode after the Civil War. And so new steel plows that... that make it much easier to plow up the land. The, the harvester and the combines are invented at this time, which makes for uh, farming much, much easier. And you only have to have a few individuals to work the farm now with these new inventions. And this expression develops, rain follows the plow. Out in this area, it rains very little. And it's always been that way. Um, prairie grass is very unique. It's able to hold on to very little bit of water in its roots. For years, it can hold on to a little bit of water when it doesn't rain, when it goes through drought seasons. But science of the day had this idea that if you change the geographic environment, you can, in fact, change the environment of the weather as well. And if you plowed up land, they would notice in the eastern part of the country where they planted tobacco in the colonial days, and then eventually that became rice, and they plowed then for uh, cotton. They noticed more and more rain would happen. So they, they, they began this idea that if you plowed up land, it would change the weather patterns, and eventually rain would come. Well, here's an interesting thing that we will talk about a lot when we get into the 20th century. Plowing up land does change weather patterns. But I'm going to talk about this a lot more in class because what they're actually going to wind up doing is changing weather patterns for the worse. And eventually they're going to lead to one of the greatest man-made disasters of all time in America. 
which will become the Dust Bowl. But it's going to take decades of destroying an environment and creating a new environment, and that is what's going to lead to, in the 1920s, the Great Dust Bowl incident. And we'll talk about that, obviously, in, in a couple, in about a, maybe about two months coming down the road or so. Now, with the Homestead Act already passed in 62, this greatly encouraged Union veterans, as the war came to an end, uh, looking for somewhere to go, encouraged them to go west. Go west. Go west, young man, becomes a huge statement at the time period. There are thousands of immigrants still coming to America. We're going to encourage them to go west as well. In fact, the picture here you see of homesteaders, this is a typical family who will go out here to these areas. Uh, this is actually an immigrant family that has come out and staked its claim out west. They probably have about 100 acres. They're digging up prairie grass and they're planting uh, wheat. And um, things are going pretty good in the beginning. But like I said, much, much later on, decades later, it will eventually create a terrible situation in America. There's also another group of people after the Civil War that will leave. They're known as the Exodusters. Uh, this is taken from the Bible book Exodus, which is when the Jews left or exited Egypt. Uh, the Exodusters are former black slaves who decided they did not want to stay in the South and be forced into sharecropping and live under a lot of strict, harsh conditions. So they just up and left and went west too. And they became known as the Exodusters to try their best to get out to the west and start farming for themselves and perhaps create a whole new life for them. So you have Union veterans going west, you have immigrants going west, you have this huge group of former slaves also going west. Uh, Oklahoma eventually becomes a state because of this. Uh, in our next video, which I'm, I'm going to try and put up later today, I'm going to explain a little bit more about this Dawes Severity Act. Um, the word severity means individual ownership. Uh, this was aimed at Native American Indians. Uh, my next uh, presentation is going to be on, on the Plains Indian Wars because the Indians were here while America's trying to homestead this area. Senator Henry Dawes decided that it would be better for Indians to learn about individual land ownership and not be forced to live on designated reservations. Teach Indians how to buy their own land, cultivate their own land, and hopefully the idea was they would assimilate naturally into American culture. Um, this will backfire. Uh, Indian lands will be taken by the thousands of acres by greedy land speculators, shrinking their, their larger reservations and shrinking them down to basically nothing and taking their land from them. Uh, this is what creates the state of Oklahoma. 15 million acres are seized from the Indians through greedy and, um, and basically corrupt land speculators, uh, big business, and they create the state of Oklahoma. And then this creates one of the funny moments in our history, the Oklahoma Sooners Boomers. Uh, there's this moment on April 22nd, 1889, where the federal government allowed for people throughout the, the previous year to start buying into this great land rush moment. Uh, there's, this is a picture taken of on April 22nd when the cannon boomed and all these people rush into the state of Oklahoma and they've got flags with them and they're going to start get to a place as fast as they can before someone else gets there and stake a claim, to put a flag into the ground and stake their claim. Sooners are individuals who snuck into Oklahoma before April 22nd and scouted out land for themselves and already planted flags so that by the time that this started, they hoped in the confusion of all this, and think about this, all these thousands of people lined up here waiting for the cannon to explode and then get in there, they thought, you know, who would notice that we snuck in? And for the most part, some of them got away with this. Others will be caught and prosecuted because it was against the law. Hence, if you know anything about the University of Oklahoma, their mascot is the Sooners, based on individuals who snuck into Oklahoma before they were actually allowed to go in there and claim land. The Long Drive. Uh, the railroad industry, as we've been talking about, is a massive industry 
now being created in America, and it will really explode after the Civil War. And the railroad industry creates a lot of under, other industries. And one of the main industries that gets created is the beef industry. It's interesting to think about how much Americans today love beef, uh, but really, prior to the Civil War, beef wasn't that big of, of a food item for us. Americans have a tradition from the English of eating more pork, uh, chicken, turkey, that sort of stuff. Um, eventually, more and more beef will come into our diet, but especially because of the Civil War. It turns out when canning food for the soldiers, beef was a product that was easy and cheaper to can, and it stayed fresh a little longer. And the Union soldier began to have a huge taste then for this beef that they were getting used to eat. Uh, after the Civil War, this is what helps create this beef industry. And with the railroad now cutting across the country, it's easy to transport beef from one place to another. But if you remember, I told you in the South, because they didn't industrialize, they didn't have an extensive railroad system in the South. So other things begins to happen. For instance, uh, the death, death of the buffalo. Again, I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next video presentation. Uh, when fighting the wars against the Indians, America realized that the Indian depended on the buffalo for everything. So they began to hunt them into extinction, and they nearly do. They nearly extinct bison from the continent of America. Uh, with that, though, it allowed people to bring cows and steers and bulls into the West by the millions and all of a sudden you have this huge cow industry, beef industry is exploding in Texas, especially in Texas. The long drive comes at this time period where cowboys, and the word cowboy means exactly what you think the word means, cowboys, men who work with cows. It comes from uh, a Spanish term, uh, term uh, uh, which I can't remember off the top of my head, and I wish I could, but... Um, Baquero, uh, the Baqueros. Uh, these, these were individuals when the Spaniards came and they conquered the Aztecs. They found out that the Aztecs were very adept at using horses. And so they trained Aztec Indians to use horses for them. And the Spaniards introduced cows into Mexico and they began to be known as Baqueros. Uh, and eventually, that word in English eventually becomes cowboys. Uh, these men who work on horses, but, but they control and raise cattle. Uh, by doing this, um, and again, we're talking tens of thousands, millions of cattle being raised now in Texas. And that created cattle towns, wherever, the, wherever you had to transport your cows from one place to another. And eventually, they got to Kansas City, where the railroads would be. If you, you would take it on this long drive, all of your cows to market into Kansas City, there you made a lot of money selling your cows to uh, various industries. And uh, then they'd get on the trains and take them where they had to be. Normally, they wind up in Chicago, where all the slaughtering houses were, and turn the cows then into beef. This creates our notion of what we think of the Wild West all these lawless towns and cowboys um, and gunslingers. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well, the gunslinger. This also drew major investors into this area. Men began to invest in railroads, invest in beef, invest in land, invest in new technologies, invest in, in meatpacking industries. And this created a lot of wealth in this country as well. Uh, but the railroad giveth and the railroad taketh away. As railroads began to become more and more popular, and they now start to build them into the southern states, the idea of the long drive eventually goes away. The heyday of cowboys in America really isn't but 20 years. 1866 to 1885 was the heyday, the, the glory days of cowboys. Um, a lot of things worked against cowboys, uh, like the railroad is the number one thing. Also, the invention of barbed wire. Uh, once the barbed wire is invented, they begin to fence in a lot of territory that you that you were normally taking your cows through easily. Now you couldn't do this anymore. You had to get them on trains, which will now extend into Texas, will extend into Arizona, where they're raising a lot of this cattle, and they don't need cowboys as much anymore. Also, the weather patterns are starting to change. There are going to be a series of blizzards. In the 1880s, 1886 is one of the worst blizzards in American history. 
followed by a series of droughts. Uh, this was a precursor. These things happened in the 1880s is a precursor again to the Dust Bowl of the 1920s. But again, people weren't really paying attention. They just thought this was a natural cycle of weather patterns. Like I said, the railroad eventually replaces the long drive for the cowboy. And I mentioned barbed wire. Here, Joseph Glidden is the man who invents barbed wire. And uh, this will revolutionize a lot. You know, fencing that is uh, very simple to make, but it's barbed. So cows, when they come up against the fence, are scratched, and they won't try to knock the fence down. They'll stay pinned into areas. And again, we're going to talk about thousands of acres that will now be fenced in. Not only does this replace the cowboy, but it also meant the end of the nomadic Indians of the West. And again, our uh, video lecture later today will be about the Plains Indian Wars. Now that we're fencing in land, we cannot allow Indians just to roam the Great Plains. Uh, just some pictures here. Uh, long drive, this is what I'm talking about here, where they're taking cattle, sometimes a thousand head, sometimes five thousand head of cattle, and you see the cowboys in the back, and they're they're moving them along. This was a uh, a very popular scene you would see in the 1860s and 70s. But once railroads come into this area, we didn't need this anymore. Um, the typical cowboy wore chaps, these leather uh, uh, pants. Well, they're not really pants; they're overlays over, over top your pants. A Levi Strauss uh, comes into this area, and denim jeans will eventually be invented. But sometimes we get cowboys mixed up with gunslingers. Gunslingers are not cowboys. They do not work with horses. Right? This is the famous Billy the Kid. Right? William Bonney was his real name. Uh, the only known photograph of him. This is the famous Wild Earp, Wyatt Earp. He was a famous lawman of the day, but really was a gunslinger first and then became a lawman. So there's a lot of romantic uh, thoughts of the old Wild West. Uh, a lot of stories are going to be written. A lot of newspapers will be sold. Remember I told you during the Civil War, a lot of things change. Journalism changes, right? They, they were selling millions of newspapers because of the war. When the war came to an end, they had to come up with something else to try and sell. The Wild West was a huge, huge profitable story for newspapers. They could tell all kinds of stories of Billy the Kid killing people left and right, Jesse James and Wyatt Earp. Uh, Wild Bill Hickok, all these famous outlaws and gunslingers of the time period. The Younger Gang, uh, another very uh, a notorious gang of criminals that went and robbed banks. And, and they would steal uh, cattle. Right? You would have these men go out and steal cattle. And these stories would be printed in newspapers and often embellished and glorified. And it helped newspapers to sell a lot of newspapers. People loved reading stories of these gunslingers. A great invention that helped at this time period is the Colt 45 revolver. Uh, there's an old saying here I have it at the bottom, God didn't make men equal, Colonel Colt made men equal. This famous six-shooter revolutionized everything at this time period. All right, and the last thing I'm going to talk to you about is mining towns, which eventually became ghost towns. Uh, the 59ers, but by the 1850s, other precious metals are being discovered, copper, lead, zinc, and it eventually led to all of these mining towns propping up in places like uh, Colorado, uh, in Nevada, in Kansas, you know, all the way up into Wyoming. There's all these mining towns that are going to start to pop up, and it's going to lead to thousands of men coming out here to try and make it rich, not by farming, but by mining. In 1859, this is where we get the 59ers, the Comstock load in, in Virginia City, Nevada. They discover this massive load of silver. Um, and this is going to lead to an economic problem in America that I'll talk about more so in class. Um, silver and gold. Uh, do you put into your monetary policy the minting of gold coins and of silver coins? Uh, the world has already decided that gold is the precious metal of all precious metals. And um, in order to make silver coins, you had to, you had to make more of them. Because it, this idea that for every one ounce of gold that was valuable, uh, 
the world decided 32 ounces of silver would equal one ounce of gold. America eventually gets that down in our country to 16 ounces. And that's going to be something very important we're going to talk about here when we come back from our Thanksgiving break. This idea of 16 ounces of silver equals one ounce of gold, which is going to lead to several economic situations in our country. A major panic is going to happen. A political party is going to almost come, go down and, and ruin, and a third political party is almost going to explode in this country, and it's all going to be because of silver. Uh, a lot of smaller lucky strikes, as they called them, which created, like I said, a lot of these uh, uh, mining towns, which eventually became ghost towns. Like over here, you see this abandoned ghost town. One place became known as Hal Dorado. Uh, because as people got rich within a year, two years, then less and less minerals are being found, and it just turned into a horrible situation. There's no law here. It's complete anarchy. Uh, this is not a place you would ever, ever want to live. Trust me. Ghost towns, uh, the growth of smelting industries, and lumbering industry explodes in America. Smelting, taking metals, and literally melting them to, so that you get all the impurities out of that metal. The impurities come to the top and they form what we call a scummy grouse. It's called known as scummy grouse. And it's scooped up and you take all the, the terrible things of the mineral out. You've got the pure mineral there in liquid form. And then you're able to smelt it. You're able to turn it into something. This eventually is what helps iron eventually become steel with the growth of smelting. And uh, that's, again, something that we'll talk about a lot later on. We talk about the rise of corporations. Another interesting side thing, the last thing I'm going to tell you right here, female equality. As people begin to come into some of these uh, territories that eventually become states, especially like Wyoming and Montana, there are few people coming here. And eventually, these things, they become states. There are very few men and a lot of women. But you need people to vote. And eventually, by the, turn, by the end of the 19th century, some of these states will actually give voting rights to females. Montana and Wyoming. All right, there's, there's, a, there's a few... Um, I'm stuttering here, and I apologize for that. I, I don't know why I'm so just stammering over my words here. But females outnumbered males. You need voters. You need people to decide and create law. You need to vote on this. So they would extend the right to vote to women in these states. The first time ever. Now, we don't have yet a national voting rights for women. That becomes a huge source of discontent for women who live in the East, who live in the established states, where they, they do not have voting rights. And eventually, this will bring back the suffrage movement in America and, of course, that's something we'll talk about in depth later on as well. All right, so this is just a quick little uh, 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 lecture on uh, homesteading. All you need to do is print out the old uh, video logs, the original video logs that are more generic. I don't need you to do anything specific on this one. And, again, those are on Edmodo if you don't already have them. And I will post this on, on Twitter or, and also on Edmodo to let you know you can start um, – looking at these. And like I said, by the end of this evening, I'll have up the second one. All right. See everybody later.